He's the founder and owner of the Stock Swoosh. Great to have you with us as always. So stocks here closing. Third worst day here for the Dow in three years. Prolonged global economic slowdown. Potentially this is the fear that has been spreading through the markets today from the coronavirus spreading. Do you feel like, as Norad mentioned, this is an ephemeral issue or that we will see prolonged period of these declines going forward? I think right now, today, everyone panicked. But when I look at the actual trading on the live day from the time we opened at 4.30 into the close, the market held on really well. Now, while it's true we opened down from Friday, we gapped down pretty big this morning, we didn't have a massive sell-off. And I would say that's a good sign for markets. Markets are trying to stabilize or trying to hold up. I think between now and tomorrow morning, it's very critical for the market. If we can wrap up and open up virtually anywhere tomorrow and rally, then this will be a short sell-off that will not last. Not that we wouldn't see another sell-off day from virus fears, but that I don't think this is going to have the massive move down that some people are expecting. So aside from the coronavirus, so there were already concerns from investors and analysts that tech is overbought, for example. Is this a turning point, do you think, for investors to kind of realize the overvaluation of certain sectors? Or to, or to your point, do you think this is just kind of a one-day thing, a one-day slide? Well, I definitely don't think tech is overbought. I mean, if you look at Apple, Apple had earnings, didn't pop and made new highs on the earnings, but really didn't have some blowout rally on the earnings. Apple is due for a nice rally. Apple is strong. Amazon had a blowout number in the earnings. To think that Amazon is going to fall off a planet is crazy town to me. So do I think that tech is overblown? No, I do not. And when I look at everything in the market, even the banks today, which fell with the market, everything seems very, very strong. When you have a market that's continually making brand new all time highs, you can't expect the market to rally every day. You can't expect new highs every week. And we've gotten in that period where we've gotten complacent. We believe that we're going to have new highs literally almost every week. And that's not reality. And the reality is that while we are down for the year, for the calendar year for 2020, in the Dow from the open until today's close, we're only eight weeks into the year. So that's really not that. If it was May, I'd have a different opinion. But it's eight weeks into the year. And actually, we are not down in the year in the SPY, and we're not down in the year in the NASDAQ. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to put a pause on this, Melissa, for a second, because we are getting confirmation that Intuit will be acquiring Credit Karma. We had seen the Wall Street Journal come out with a story. Seven billion will be this deal, cash and stock, and expected to be neutral to accretive, according to Intuit, to their non-GAAP earnings per share. Uh, we're watching, of course, markets here close here on the day. It has been really hard to look at how Intuit investors are looking at this, especially because of the declines that we'd seen, broadly speaking. But we know that it's a significant significant acquisition for Intuit, and given that this would give the company much more data and many more customers as well uh, for them to sell into with their tax services and products as well. But this now coming out, uh, confirming the reports that we had seen here earlier in the day. Um, all right, so the purchase price, we'll get to that. All right, Melissa, I think you're still back with us. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on this uh, at, at all, but I think it's a pretty big deal. What do you think? Well, I think the stock looks like a good buy if it gaps up tomorrow morning. It's up $5 here on that news. If it, if it opens right around the 20 period moving average tomorrow morning with the market, this could be a good, good buy because, again, this is not that far off the highs. The last brand new long time high this stock made was in the last week over 306. So, although it sounds expensive, even buying in here around 292 where it's trading right now, you know, this could still rally and make a new high pretty quickly, especially if it has. Uh, some bullish moves in the market tomorrow with it as well. And I'm seeing Shaq just reported, and Shaq is tanking, tanking as we speak here right now. This one's down. Wow, is this tanking. This is almost down 10 points. Yeah, we'll hit on Shake Shack. Um, actually, you know what? Let's hit on Shake Shack right now since you brought it up. Um, I think one of the more shocking numbers that I'm seeing right here off the bat is the same store sales falling 3.6%. We know that was a weak spot for Shake Shack in the last earnings report as well and gave investors a little bit of pause. Melissa, what do you think is the biggest takeaway here from Shake Shack and why are investors so nervous um, about that foot traffic, especially for Shake Shack? Well, when you look at the market again, which has been so strong and you look at Shake Shack, even in the last three, four months since the prior earnings, the one before this one back in November, you think, oh, this stock is nowhere near the highs. This stock is not trading bullishly. This stock 
Looks like it's lower, could even break 60. Right now it's trading down around 67. Last brand new all-time highs on this was far, far away, back in August around 104. So I don't, you know, this, no one's really been buying this in the last few months. And when you have such a strong market and you have a stock that's down like this for this, this really could have gone so easily up tonight on earnings. Just that even at 80 would have been a beautiful buy for this to run up. But it isn't doing it. This is tanking. I would expect this lower no matter no matter what the market does. Yeah, and I think the fact that same store sales, you know, as Nora mentioned, a 3.6 percent decline is is really significant uh, here. What do we think yeah. are the reasons that the same store sales fell so significantly in a very important again holiday quarter? We're still getting into the last innings here of the earnings season for the fourth quarter. I mean, you're supposed to be going to the mall during the holiday shopping season. You're supposed to be eating at the mall. You're supposed to be having some snacks as you're holiday shopping. And this was a pretty disappointing 3.6% decline. I don't know. In New York, people love Shake Shack. I don't know if you've ever been to the yes. one in New York. I mean, there, there's like a line around the block, which uh, the first time I went there, I thought it was hilarious. So if you're in New York City, you love Shake Shack. People go there like 24 hours a day. <laughs> but the reality is that most people now are trying to eat healthy. I mean, when you look at Beyond Meat, and you look at Shake Shack, Shake Shack has to do something to start. Uh, they have to offer some kind of product here now, I think, to compete. Uh, that's going to put them in a different arena to improve things. I don't know what that is, uh, you know, but I, I will tell you that when you look at a Beyond Meat and then you look at a Shake Shack, you say, OK, people are gravitating more towards eat, not eating meat. Now, personally, I like meat. And again, people in New York City love their Shake Shack hamburgers. And but but for for the sales to be this way is not good and they need new marketing or some new products. Yeah, they're also trying to leverage delivery more, creating a partnership with Grubhub, using Grubhub as their exclusive delivery partner. But taking a look at some of these results more specifically on earnings, they did beat expectations coming in at six cents per share. But then on revenue, that was a slight miss. 151 million versus 153 million expected. As they're investing more in delivery, which we know is lower margin, it's going to cost them more to deliver your burger to your door than for you to go into the store and pick it up. What number, what metric are investors going to be more focused on if we're seeing this weakness in same store sales? Maybe they're, maybe management is relying on that delivery number to tick up, which also could eat into margins as well. So what should investors be looking towards? I don't, I don't think necessarily everybody uses Grubhub delivery services. People think of pizza for getting delivery. People don't always think of getting hamburgers delivered. Again, if you live in a metropolitan city like New York, Los Angeles, you might do a lot of the delivery services, but that is not going to make or break your numbers. You've got to have across the board people using the delivery service all across the country. And I just don't think we're living in a society where you see that necessarily. People like the drive ups, they like the drive up windows and for delivery, they like pizza. And again, like you said, there's an added cost to having it delivered. And right now people are, they don't see what's special. You know, Starbucks, Starbucks is like, oh, there's something special to the coffees. That's why people pay more. For Shake Shop, they need something special. Special. That's what that's that's where there has to be some kind of thing that makes it exciting, some kind of marketing thing, or some kind of shtick like a commercial, like with a Peloton. Right. I can't talk about Peloton earlier. It's Peloton, Peloton, Peloton. Mm -hmm. I can't watch TV at night without seeing a Peloton commercial. Yeah. So shake that needs better marketing. Full stop. Right. It's as you mentioned, though, people who like it, like it, they know it, they know it, the Portobello, you know, sandwich, et cetera. Uh, HP, I want to get to this really quickly. The company coming in with adjusted earnings here of 65 cents a share, also announcing $15 billion in a repurchase program for the company, which is absolutely huge. Uh, earnings coming in, as I mentioned, 65 cents adjusted, and then revenue on the top line coming here in line with expectations, $14.6 billion. Uh, the estimated was $16.63 billion. Now, I will say this is lower than what they had seen in the prior year, which was $14.7 billion in terms of revenue here for HP. Let's get a check on how HP shares are doing after hours here on this. Uh, a bit of a, you know, I would say a pretty decent report. Um, the company also saying they're reaching out to Xerox to explore if this combination creates more value. We know that Xerox had uh, tried to at least put out a hostile bid uh, for that right now. Uh, Melissa, what's HP doing right now after hours and what do you see for this company going forward? I think right now HP is up and a lot of bottom feeders might want to be buying this here on the dip here and now it's rallying today. But looking overall at the stock and the look of the stock, again, I'm a technical analysis person. The stock is still in a downtrend. The previous highs in this were 10 years ago. 
back in 2010. This stock is a long way from being a buy to me. It, could, it might rally tomorrow if the market rallies, but I wouldn't go long this tomorrow without the market. This is a long, long, long way to go. And this this still might have some kind of takeover that might occur in it in the next 12 to 24 months. I don't I don't think today's earnings and this rally in here right now tonight is going to save this chart. Yeah, we're seeing some opposing factors for HP overall. And on the one hand, there's a relative strength in the commercial PC market. They're a big player there, only mm -hmm. second. Uh, to Lenovo when it comes to PC vendors, regional strength as well, but then some weakness in the printing business, for example, um, especially for the home market. Hope had mentioned uh, this, this partnership that they had been discussing with Xerox or reaching out to Xerox to explore if there is a combination that creates value for shareholders as additive to strategic, their financial plan. Do you think consolidation in this space is going would potentially be good for HP and Xerox uh, and to overcome those challenges of trying to get market share from some of the other players in the space? I think it would be good for both companies for the consolidation. I mean, again, you, you have so many different companies out there competing. And again, if you're if you're if you're using these products and services, you're competing against the Microsofts, the Adobe's. You're can, you have such big competitors now. That's one of the reasons the stock has been almost in free fall mm. for the last ten years. You've got even even Best Buy. You could even count them. I mean. When, when you have uh, retail out there selling different products like this at cheap prices, and again, there's no innovation going on here, and that's where a partnership could really, a good partnership, a strong partnership can help a, a company like this because it helps them to innovate and also tightening up then on expenses because obviously this, this company has taken a loss. I didn't see or hear exactly what these earnings said, but this isn't exactly what I'd say would be a blowout earnings. It's a slight rally up. But it's got a long way to go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy back in this stock until it gets over 35. And the chances of that happening, even in 2020, are slim to none without some kind of, some kind of takeover or, or combination deal. Not that yeah. it couldn't happen. Right. And and some have said that you know obviously these are two weak companies trying to come together and make something out of you know, what are both declining businesses, uh, you know, it's a wonder what they could do together, any potential quote unquote synergies as these companies like to say um, all the time. Okay, great stuff, uh, Melissa. So let's just recap here. We got the final news coming from Intuit. They will be buying now Credit Karma. Shake Shack, uh, you know, really disappointing with their earnings coming out. Uh, and then HP, which on uh, the results side of things, a uh, pretty decent, uh, but nothing really to write home about. That's right. All right, we're going to leave it there with Melissa. Melissa Armour is the founder and owner of the stock Swoosh.